Thank you for sharing that uh, with us. This is a real treat for me to get a chance uh, to talk to you about this. I, I almost don't know where to begin, but I, I was a little surprised at the, when you were talking just at the very end there when you said, actually gave a little bit of a prescription. You said, we cannot walk away. So let's take it to the next step as the president is, is trying to figure out what he and the country should do. Um, even if you're not willing to make a, a full-blown prescription, what's the, the single most important thing you would want him to know before he makes the decision and the single most important question you would want him to ask? Um, I'll, again, stay away from policy prescriptions. And, uh, um, but based on what I experienced, um, there still are many moderates in Pakistan and Afghanistan that adamantly oppose the Taliban. And, um, and surprisingly, things in Pakistan have gone fairly well in terms of since the Taliban pushed into the Swat Valley and were close to Islamabad. The army then did push them out of that area. Many Pakistanis were incredibly angry, and, and they, they themselves started saying, this isn't Islam, what the Taliban are doing. These are not, this is not jihad. They're essentially criminals. There's a massive kidnapping network that I was part of that includes many more Pakistanis. And the Taliban have sort of, I think, um, undercut themselves in Pakistan. And it's a good sign that I think more and more Pakistanis are seeing that. Um, there also is, on the downside, of, of a widespread perception of the United States is occupying Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and it's, it's been said by many people, uh, but I would just think a, a key thing is how do you more consistently, effectively, and, and quietly back local moderates in these countries? Um, they're there, and they're, they're, they're questioning our, our commitment at this time. Let me ask you another question about your, your, your own story. You talked a little bit about the, the moment when you decided uh, to escape. And I, I just wonder if you could to elab elaborate on, on the decision uh, a little bit more. I mean, how much of it was you really thought it was going to work, and how much of it was I just can't take it anymore? Uh, I didn't. I never thought it was going to work. I uh, I thought I would try, and then I'd feel better the next day for having tried. And the, this sort of you know our, our super duper caper uh, consisted. The initial part of it was I was just going to get up and go to the bathroom. Uh, so I. I mean, we had planned everything out, and a couple weeks earlier, I'd, I had found a car tow rope in the house where I was being held. It was next to some motor oil and wrenches, and, uh, and what prompted it was that our guards, we were constantly lied to about um, uh, that there were negotiations going on, and they, were, they promised they'd compromise, and um, the, 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 they had just given this, this preposterous story to us that the U.S. was going to trade prisoners from Guantanamo Bay for us. So. Um, after that, thinking about it all the time, planning something, um, the power came back on that night, and we were just exasperated. And then on a personal level, um, I wanted to try because, um, and this isn't a very journalistic neutral uh, statement, but um, we had really come to hate our captors. Um, we, we saw their, there was even a hypocrisy playing out in front of me where um, Tahir, the journalist who was with me would sit there and say, this is not Islam. You invited us to an interview. This is not Pashtun Wali. This isn't how you treat uh, guests. And, and there was just, we just, we wanted to end the suffering of our families and we wanted them to get nothing. And you thought if you didn't succeed, they wouldn't kill you the next day? Throughout the captivity, they made it very clear they would kill um, Tahir and Assad first. And the hatred towards uh, Afghans and Pakistanis that work with the United States is much deeper than the hatred towards Americans. And they, they constantly said, and this has happened in past cases, there was a kidnapping of an Italian journalist where they killed the driver and translator um, and then you know, got a larger ransom for the journalist. So I didn't feel in that much danger. Um, one member of the Haqqani family kept calling me the golden hen, expecting me to <laughs> lay the golden egg, um, which was never laid. And, I'm so happy and lucky to be here. Yeah, um, you're very clear in the article, and the Times has been very clear that no ransom was paid. Yet there's still some skepticism sure. uh, out in the world about that. I think some people find it hard to believe that your captors just slept through the night yeah. without any incentives. Uh, I expect you to repeat your denial, but how do, they, how do you confront the skepticism? 
Just that, uh, I don't know, I would never write a five-part series that was a lie. Just personally, and, and this newspaper uh, would never run a series based on a lie. Uh, I know what I lived through and I know what Tahir lived through. Um, I've talked ad nauseum to the Pakistani, uh, this young captain who led us on his base that night. Um, no one was in the area. He had no idea we were coming. Um, uh, it took them, I don't know, I think it took them eight or nine hours to get in a helicopter to move us out of the base. Um, and I know there's skepticism out there, but no money was paid. There's been some uh, writing about an earlier plan in our kidnapping to try to bribe our guards. Uh, there was information coming in about a village we were being held in. Uh, we were never held in that village. And you know, attempts were made to try to get information about where we were being held, but they were never able to make contact with, you know, or frankly, give money to anybody that was actually living with us. So um, 